I'm Carolina Duth, and I'm a member of CADCA's evaluation and research team. If you haven't participated in one of our webinars previously, the purpose of this webinar series is to introduce coalition members, public health practitioners, and substance misuse preventionists to current and relevant research being conducted in the substance use and community coalition fields. CADCA, along with its Geographic Health Equity Alliance, is excited to offer this installment of the webinar series on perception of harm of secondhand exposure to e-cigarettes and its effect on support for a tobacco-free campus policy. CADCA's Geographic Health Equity Alliance, or GIA, is a CDC-funded national network dedicated to reducing health disparities related to tobacco and cancer. GIA's focus is on reducing geographic disparities which they define as the differences in health behaviors, outcomes, and policies related to where people live, work, and play. For more information about GIA and promoting health equity, visit geohealthequity.org. I'm joined for this installment by Dr. Matthew Grossheim. He will present on his article, Aerosol Vapor or Chemicals, College Student Perceptions of Harm from Electronic Cigarettes and Support for a tobacco-free campus policy, which was published in the Journal of College Health in 2020, and will discuss how coalitions can use health communications campaigns to influence risk perception and public policy making on substance use issues. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Matthew Rausheim. Dr. Matthew Rausheim is an assistant professor in the Department of Global and Community Health at George Mason University. He has published 49 peer-reviewed manuscripts manuscripts which focus on alcohol and tobacco prevention and control, especially relatively new products that are marketed to young people. His research has been cited by members of Congress and researchers at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, as well as in reports by the World Health Organization, National Alcohol Beverage Control Association, the Quebec National Institute of Public Health, and by popular press, including NPR and the New York Times. His research on electronic cigarettes has also been cited in city and county ordinances prohibiting the distribution and sale of e-cigarettes and flavored tobacco products. He currently serves as chair of the Tobacco-Free Mason Committee. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Rossheim to begin. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to share with all of you some, of, uh, some information about one of my research studies that, that we conducted uh, that looked at how simple differences in wording may be beneficial for both accurately conveying risk of harms from exposure to secondhand emissions from e-cigarettes, as well as increasing support for tobacco-free campus policies. So one of the first public health guidelines to help reduce the spread of the coronavirus was social distancing. However, shortly thereafter, there was a major push to replace this with the phrase physical distancing in recognition of the importance and health benefits of maintaining social connections during this pandemic. So you all already recognize the importance of word choice in health communication. This is especially true for tobacco, where there is a continuously shifting landscape of emerging products coupled with powerful industry marketing that presents frames to compete with public health interest groups, and vie for public attention and acceptance. So there are many different framing devices used in tobacco marketing, uh, including glamorous Im imagery, um, and in risk communication, including grotesque imagery and graphic warning labels, and counter-marketing uh, narratives about industry manipulation, um, and even simple words used to describe tobacco products and consumer behaviors, right? And so with this in mind, I know this is going to shock all of you, um, but there's a relatively new type of tobacco product that is the most prevalent form of tobacco use among youth and young adults. So what do we call these new tobacco products? Electronic cigarettes, e-cigarettes, e-cigs, electronic nicotine devices, electronic nicotine delivery systems, vapes, vaping devices, electronic vaping devices, nicotine va vaping devices, right? There's all sorts of different names, not to mention when you start to look at different types of devices like e-hookahs, vape pens, pod systems, vape pods, pod vapes, vapes, pod mods, or even brands like Juul, Puff Bar, Smoke Tech, or Smock, Vapresso, right? Um, so the big question is, 
what impact do all of these different names have on how harmful people perceive these products to be and their likelihood of using these products and whether they support their inclusion in clean air or other tobacco control policies. So Google Trends is a useful tool for helping identify how much people Google search different, different terms. So right here is a graph of the number of e-cigarette related Google searches over time. And so what I want you to do is try to keep your eye on these blue, yellow, and red lines. And I'm gonna introduce to the same graph vaping related search terms. So the vaping related search terms are in green and purple. And so the e-cig and e-cigarette lines get totally flattened because since 2013, vape has absolutely dominated as the term of choice. So why does it matter if vape is the primary terminology used for these products? There are a couple of reasons. So for one, there was this study published in the American Journal of Public Health in October of 2019. And this study examined news articles uh, published across the US and found that those articles that had vape in the headline were far more likely to positively frame these products and negatively frame FDA regulation of these products compared to articles using e-cigarette or e-cig in their headline. In addition, uh, the words that we use for these products might influence how harmful people perceive them to be. And not only what we call these devices, but also the stuff that comes out of these devices that both users and non-users breathe in. So what do you call the stuff that comes out of electronic cigarettes? Well, consistent with vapes being the pervasive terminology for these devices, their emissions are commonly referred to as vapor or vape clouds. So why does this matter? Well, shaping the way that people, that people talk about uh, and, and describe secondhand smoke has been a tobacco industry tactic dating back to at least the early 1970s. So for example, tobacco industry representatives have, uh, have refused to use the term secondhand smoke and have instead referred to it as environmental tobacco smoke to make it sound more natural and with weaker linkages to their products and thereby uh, less harmful. Similarly, these industry representatives have used the term passive smoking, uh, which carries the connotation of indifference and may be used to downplay the annoyance that's often felt by non-smokers who are unable to avoid exposure. Today, uh, we know that some people seem to associate the word vapor with harmless water vapor, right? And we know that this stuff is not harmless. We know that it contains high levels of ultra-fine particles and other toxins that are likely to increase the risk of cardiovascular and lung disease. And these are the conditions that account for the majority of smoking-related mortality. Um, recent laboratory evidence from mice also shows that e-cigarette emissions cause lung cancer and bladder hyperplasia, uh, which is often an initial stage in the development of cancer. And so while most people agree that smoking and secondhand smoke are bad for human health, the narrative for e-cigarettes has been much more focused on this assumption that it's probably less harmful than smoking, including the made up invalid statistic that e-cigarettes are 95% less harmful than cigarettes. So how do we better communicate the harmfulness of this stuff that comes out of e-cigarettes? Well, we can start by using more accurate terminology that may differentially communicate risk associated with exposure. So the public health community more often refers to e-cigarette emissions as an aerosol that's made up of chemicals. And previous research suggests that using the word chemicals might be associated with greater perceived harm. So what we did is we conducted a study at George Mason University where we sought to examine whether the terminology used to describe the secondhand output of e-cigarettes 
influenced undergraduate students' perceptions of its harmfulness. And we also examined whether perceived harmfulness of secondhand exposure to e-cigarettes was associated with support for prohibiting e-cigarette use on campus. And so we studied this using a randomized experiment where we randomized what questions we asked different classrooms of college students. So what's the purpose of using a randomized experiment? The purpose of randomizing these classrooms is that there's something special about randomization. If you randomize uh, large enough groups of people to different study conditions, then statistically, these different groups that you're comparing should be comparable on all characteristics. So that's what we did. Uh, we invited instructors of 167 class sections uh, in, of a junior level English class to participate in our study uh, and nearly one third agreed. We then randomized these classrooms to one of three different study conditions, vapor or aerosol or chemicals. So 17 or 18 classrooms each received questions about what they know or believe about the health effects of secondhand e-cigarette aerosol or chemicals or vapor. And so there were 889 students that were present when we distributed these surveys in the classrooms. 94% of the students participated. And of those who participated, 94% provided complete data for analyses. So we had a final sample of nearly 800 students. So everyone in, the, in, the, in each survey, they, uh, everyone got nearly the same survey, but some classroom sections were asked about how harmful they thought secondhand exposure to e-cigarette vapor is to a person's health, and others were asked about chemicals or aerosol instead of vapor. So we just replaced the word in the question. So in our analyses, we also adjusted for numerous potentially confounding variables, uh, including smoking status, e-cigarette use behavior, um, how harmful they perceived secondhand exposure to cigarette smoke to be, among other demographic factors as well. So we asked uh, students questions about whether they would prefer that George Mason University be a, uh, a smoke-free campus, and they answered yes or no. And then we asked them whether they would prefer George Mason University be a tobacco-free campus, including e-cigarettes. And again, they answered yes or no. So th this graph shows that our randomization process worked. So in all of these three groups, aerosol, chemicals, and vapor groups, they were all, uh, all comparable on all of the measured demographic characteristics, on uh, the participants' previous use of tobacco products, and how harmful they perceived uh, exposure to secondhand smoke to be. So this table shows one of our main study findings, which is that compared to the vapor condition, chemicals and aerosol conditions were associated with twice the odds of perceiving secondhand exposure to e-cigarettes to be harmful or very harmful. So just by asking students about the harmfulness of aerosol or chemicals, rather than asking about vapor, students were twice as likely to say that it was harmful or very harmful rather than slightly harmful or not at all harmful. And again, these analyses adjusted for numerous potentially confounding variables, including their e-cigarette use um, and, and how harmful they perceived exposure, secondhand exposure to, to cigarette smoke to be, um, which both were statistically significantly associated with perceptions of harmfulness from exposure to e-cigarettes. Our other main study finding shown here was that students who perceived uh, secondhand exposure to e-cigarettes to be more harmful were more likely to support a 100% tobacco-free campus policy that included e-cigarettes, even after adjusting for their e-cigarette use and their support for a smoke-free campus policy, um, which was strongly associated with increased odds of supporting a 100% tobacco-free campus policy. So in conclusion, our study highlights the importance of using accurate terminology like aerosol and chemicals to describe e-cigarette emissions. So tobacco prevention uh, or tobacco policy advocates and communicate communication campaign developers should recognize the power of framing and avoid using inaccurate terms uh, that 
perpetuate these misconceptions of minimal harm from e-cigarette use and secondhand exposure to e-cigarettes. So can your word choice help combat this epidemic? I think so. I think that this is a winnable battle. Um, we can all choose what words we use to describe these products and their emissions. And those choices impact how harmful people perceive these products to be, which in turn is associated with their support for tobacco control policies. And so I wanted to show this, this other uh, Google Trend image as well, um, because this helps demonstrate this potential for success. So you can see that despite the tobacco industry's attempt to call it passive smoking or environmental tobacco smoke, today, most people call it secondhand smoke. Um, so rather than talking about the vapor from vapes, let's reframe the conversation and use more accurate terminology and talk about the chemicals from e-cigarettes. So because of the rigorous methods that we use, specifically the experimental study design, this study has what we refer to as strong internal validity. That means that we are very scientifically confident in our study findings. What we're less certain about though is the external validity. That means the extent to which these study findings apply to other populations, because this study was, was only conducted among students at one university. Um, however, we are conducting follow-up studies on this topic, including a more general population sample of adults. And uh, along with this, we're testing wording for not only emissions, but also combinations of wordings for the devices and their emissions. So we're randomizing to, to multiple different conditions at the same time. Um, so they're asked about electronic cigarettes, uh, e-cigarettes or vapes, and then also about uh, different wordings for the emissions. So I was told during another presentation of this study that if you ask kids, vaping is what kids do and e-cigarettes are what adults use to quit smoking. And so I was really interested in whether adults share this view, if, if uh, what adults' perceptions are of what e-cigarettes and what vapes are. So in this follow-up study, um, we, we recently collected data from a sample of more than 450 adults across the US using Amazon's Metanical Turk application or program. Um, and so we just finished data collection. So these results are, are that I'm presenting in this slide are just preliminary and not yet published. Um, but we're finding that most adults, around 85% of our sample, thought when they were asked this question, they thought that e-cigarettes and vapes are the same thing. And for those that said no, that they're not the same thing, we were curious. We wanted to know what they thought the difference was. And so while no singular response was especially highly prevalent, um, there was quite a variety of different types of perceived differences between e-cigs and vapes. And I listed some of these here. Um, some of them thought that one of the terms was more broad or that it was slang. Um, they thought there might be differences in the device in terms of their function, complexity, whether the device was reusable. There might be a difference in their look or shape, um, the flavors available, the, the strength or nicotine content of the product, uh, the price points, and then whether you were able to use uh, other products, whether it was just for nicotine or tobacco or whether it could be used for oils, vapor, um, herbs, or marijuana as well. So if anything, I think these preliminary findings help support the notion that uh, of using the term e-cigarettes in lieu of vapes for, for adults because most adults view them as the same thing. Um, in addition, I think this also speaks to the importance of utilizing images in our monitoring of the use of these, these products so that our surveillance data is as accurate as possible. And in all the studies that we'd done, we'd, we'd use these uh, images as well to make it very clear what we were talking about when we referred to e-cigarettes or vapes. So I wanna thank all my collaborators for their contributions to this study. Uh, I listed for you here the um, full study citation for your reference. And I want to uh, thank you all for the opportunity to share some of my research with you. 
I'm very excited. I wanted to leave plenty of time here to be able to hear what questions you all have and uh, what suggestions you might all have for future research in this, in this area. All right, we're gonna start the Q&A session. Uh, first, Katka's gonna ask a few questions and then we're gonna start asking your questions that I'm finding in the Q&A box. I see there's already five there. So please keep typing them in while I start it off. And actually, I'm gonna start with a question that is sort of related to something someone put in the Q&A box. And it was something I was kind of thinking about including in the, this list of CADCA questions. Um, you chose aerosols, vapor, and chemicals to test. Were there any other options you were thinking about to test in this study? Um, and this question in the Q&A box says they're, they've been using the word emissions. Like, was, there, was that an option you considered? Um, and why did you choose specifically the three you ended up with? Great question. So, uh, so we we initially used in our in this first study that I'm presenting on the word vapor because that's been been uh, perpetuated by the the pro vape community um, and aerosol and chemicals because we saw those most commonly used um, as what the public health community would use to describe the the output or emissions. They would refer to it as an aerosol made up of chemicals, and I think that is uh, technically uh, much more accurate than, than vapor, which people seem to uh, associate with harmless water vapor. However, when we were writing up the results of this study, when we wanted to collectively refer to these terminologies, uh, it, it, but not one specifically aerosol, chemical, or vapor, we, we recognized that we were using the term emissions uh, to refer to them generally. And so in this subsequent study that we, we conducted where we've collected data from 450 um, adults across the US, uh, we included the word, along with testing the, the uh, vapes and e-cigarettes, we included aerosol, chemicals, vapor, and emissions. So we did test, we are testing that wording as well to see um, whether that is associated with uh, perceptions of, of harm from secondhand exposure. Great question. All right, so we'll start with now the first question on this slide. At the end of the presentation, you stated that the word choices we as public health practitioners and coalition members make do matter. What can we do to make sure that our communications efforts don't have the opposite effect of what we intend? And how can we influence word choice in the general public to use terms like chemicals rather than vapor? Yeah, this is such a great question and such an important question because just like passing poor tobacco control legislation can cause more harm than good, poorly planned communication campaigns can have major negative unintended consequences. So overall, it's very important to be careful about the messages that you're sending and to be very strategic throughout the entire process. So who are you trying to reach and why? What message is important to send to this audience and why? Um, what is the most appropriate way to reach this audience? Um, these questions are, are important, not only to make sure that you aren't being counter effective, but also just to make sure that you aren't wasting resources by being ineffective. In selecting previously developed counter marketing messages to use, um, like if you're using uh, paid, paid media, uh, I think it's really important that if you're paying for these messages, that they've already been tested um, with your target audience and have demonstrated effectiveness before you launch. And to ensure that it is effective and not counter effective, it's critical to test and evaluate um, these messages that you're using locally. I think it's easy for people to downplay the importance of evaluation when you can see that it's worked elsewhere, but not everything that has worked always will work and works everywhere, right? And so I view this, this evaluation as an essential part of the feedback loop. It helps you be better able to understand why things aren't working uh, 
the, you know, a, as you think they should be working, it helps you visualize some of your successes prior to policy change. And equally as important, um, being transparent about this, it can help others in the field be more confident in their choice to use or not use those same, uh, those same messages. And depending on the goal of your message, you can evaluate in different ways. Um, so for example, if your message is designed to promote cessation, you could compare the calls to quit lines on days when the messages aired versus when they didn't air. Now that's what uh, the New York City Health Department did. Um, and finally, uh, I would, I think another important point, even still just on the, the first part of this question, but to make sure that it's not uh, having a, a counter effect to, to what we're intending, I think it's very important to be very skeptical of any counter marketing that the tobacco industry has funded directly or indirectly and any counter marketing that they're promoting again, directly or indirectly, there's this classic 2002 study published in the American Journal of Public Health that shows that exposure to the truth campaign counter marketing uh, was consistently associated with an increase in anti-tobacco attitudes and beliefs. Whereas people who were exposed to Philip Morris's uh, sponsored Think Don't Smoke campaign were more open-minded to the idea of smoking after viewing their so-called counter-marketing messages. So I, I think it's really important that in, in really all of the tobacco control efforts that we do, that we're always very skeptical of industry efforts as they have a direct um, financial conflict of interest with tobacco control. Okay, so that was a very long answer to the, the first part of the question. The, the second part of the response will be a lot shorter. So um, how can we influence word choice uh, in the general public? I think that what we're doing right here is a very important first step in, in changing the word choice. Um, by having tobacco and substance use prevention and control professionals across the country buying into using more accurate terminology that better reflects the uh, associated risks um, and, and replacing the words vapor and, and vape with, uh, with those words. Um, and by, by using this more accurate terminology in fact sheets and earned media in presentations with important stakeholders and policymakers, I think it helps shape the conversation. Um, and I think that's an important first step towards, uh, towards changing the, the narrative. So, th so thank you for the opportunity to begin to disseminate this work. All right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, George Mason University has a tobacco-free campus committee that advocates for a 100% tobacco-free campus policy. How has the committee been able to use the findings from your research to advance the cause? Great. So. First of all, a huge thank you to everyone at CADCA who has helped support our committee, especially in helping us strategize. Um, and to get to the question, I think framing the issue is a big part of strategizing. Um, so we want a 100% tobacco-free campus policy that includes e-cigarettes. So when we present uh, to our university's decision makers, uh, we aren't talking about the tobacco-free campus policy by saying, um, you know, everyone knows the harms of smoking and vaping is really bad too, right? So we frame the conversation about e-cigs from the beginning by saying something like, there is a new tobacco epidemic that needs to be addressed. Uh, e-cigarettes have been marketed as a safe alternative to smoking and also marketed as a way to circumvent clean air laws. However, we continue to learn more and more about how e-cigarettes um, pose not only the same major risks that cigarettes do, but also present their own unique risks as well, including lung injuries, explosion injuries, and fires. Um, and more recently, we've been framing the issue as young people who, young people in the US who use electronic cigarettes are five times more likely to be infected with COVID-19. So we are framing the issue within our committee in presentations that we have with decision makers, and we will continue to, to do this in our, in our subsequent communication campaigns that we have. And I think talking about 
e-cigarettes and aerosol or chemicals rather than vapes or vapor is just a small part of this larger framing goal. But I strongly believe that all of these little things that you do add up. All right, we're gonna to move to a few of the participant questions and then maybe come back to these questions from CADGA. I do wanna finish off these other uh, questions though. Uh, so first, uh, someone has a specific question about your study. What was the age range and gender of the participants in, of the college student participants in the study? It's a great question. Um, most of them were in the young adult age range of 18 to 24. Um, I don't know the, the exact uh, demographic background. It's, it's available in the, in the manuscript, um, but there's usually a, a pretty even split between males and females. And we, we statistically adjusted for um, sex in our analyses as well. So our analyses were not, um, age or, or sex dependent, but it is a, a sample of college students. Um, so mostly young adults. The, the age range for the next study that we conducted though, the, the follow-up study of, of uh, using Amazon M, uh, Mechanical Turk um, is a more general adults, uh, adult population. So it's still relatively even split between males and females. Um, however, the the median and mean age is in in the 30s rather than a, a 18 to 24 um, sample. All right, and we have another question about participants. I think um, this question is about can the results of this research be applied to middle and high school age students or have you seen, have there been similar studies done with middle and high school age students? That's a great question. So there haven't been, uh, to, to my knowledge, studies that have looked at this, this word choice uh, in this way, it's associations with perceived harm and, and support for uh, tobacco-free policies among uh, uh, youth. Um, that would be a, a great study to conduct. I think theoretically we would, we would expect to have um, similar findings uh, assuming that that they, um, uh, you know, we used images and made sure that that we made clear what products exactly we were talking about and, and used uh, definitions to to clearly define. Um, but that is a gap. Uh, the main main limitation of our study was the limited external validity. So um, we we don't know for sure. Great question. All right, um, so here's a question about just what terms someone should be using. If they're writing a public facing document for youth, would you recommend using both vaping and e-cigarette as descriptions? Uh, this person uses vaping as a verb and then e-cigarette as the noun. Yeah, that's, that's challenging. I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic about how we can frame uh, um, the, the devices and their, their emissions uh, more accurately uh, to better communicate risk. But the, the verb um, of, of vaping uh, is, it was brilliant marketing, vaping and juuling, because um, it's hard to replace that with e-cigging or something like that, right? It's, it's, it's not going to be as catchy. Um, I would... Uh, it, 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 I think it's very, very much dependent on, on the, the context of what specifically you're trying to convey. But I think as much as possible, avoiding calling the emissions vapor, um, which people pers uh, seem to associate with harmless water vapor, and um, when possible, using the term e-cigarette, uh, assuming that you know you test it with your your target audience and that they recognize that. Um, that the devices that they might sometimes refer to as vaping devices are fall within the category of e-cigarettes. Um, I think it's better better to use those terminology because it it ties them more with you know traditional cigarettes and and the harms of 
chemicals and aerosol, um, and perhaps even visuals, not, uh, you know, visuals of the products that you're talking about when possible. Um, but in terms of going back to the, the counter effective, you don't want to be showing um, these devices being used by, you know, attractive, popular looking kids in these in these ads, right, because it could be um, uh, portraying you know behavior that they that they might model so maybe just the devices themselves and again it depends on the the kind of context of what you're creating so hopefully that was helpful uh so we have a question similar i like related to terminology i think mm -hmm. and, and let me just, uh, and, let me just oh, add that last sure. question um in we've we've been suggested in the policy language itself to be inclusive, to define the terminology and also be inclusive of all of the terms used. So instead of just tobacco free, say smoke free, tobacco free, and um, vape free, because some might, if they're vaping on campus or using e-cigarettes on campus, argue that, no, I don't have tobacco or nicotine in this. So I think as a best practice for the policy language itself, being inclusive of all of the different terminology is important, but in your counter marketing, you can be, you know, more more strategic, or strategic in a different way, I guess. So we have a question about e hookah. So we have, how can they reframe this device? They've found that neither youth or adults seem to identify it as a device that can deliver nicotine and other aerosol combinations, even though it's done for parties and lounges, et cetera. So the, the question is, how do they try to communicate risk associated with e hookahs or? Yeah, I think so. I think that's what they're looking at because people aren't seeing the the risk, they don't view it as something that is associated with e-cigarettes. It's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, from, I, I, might, I might be wrong about this, but from my understanding, it's it's a different type of device, but it's, it's used um, very similarly to e-cigarettes. So uh, I don't know if it's, it's especially um, popular in, in your locality or something like that, but um, if, if you're able to, to draw parallel, if they recognize that e-cigarettes are harmful, but they're, they're caught up on at the fact that e is not, perhaps um, you could draw parallels between the two and, and try to explain that, you know, it's, it's, very, very likely that it has the same harms, but I, I'm not uh, an expert on, on e hookahs, so I'm sorry that I can't provide more insight. So we have more questions about terminology, even this one I saw in the chat, so I'm grabbing it out of there. But please, if you do want me to answer a question or ask your question in the Q&A, to put it in the Q&A, because I may not see it in the chat. Um, does using acronyms like ENS or EVALI -E in ESIG related conversations reduce the impact of the message since these acronyms circumvent the power of the descriptive language? So we haven't tested that, but I think there's strong reason to believe that, that those acronyms, um, they're far more scientific, right? And scientific communication doesn't, doesn't necessarily make good for good counter marketing so usually when we're testing counter marketing messages they, they when we're developing counter marketing messages it relies on a lot of the same marketing principles that the tobacco industry and other industries use to try to promote behavior so the more news like or the more scientific presentation of information is um the more people are going to kind of tune it out and the less it's going to have an impact so as an example in in testing counter marketing messages, oftentimes what the control or the comparison group will be is just very factual news based stories or things like that. So I think to the, the question using ENDS to, to stand for electronic nicotine delivery systems, or EVALI, 
um, which is electronic cigarette or vaping slash vaping associated lung injury. I don't think those are very powerful terminology to use. If you call it, um, you know, uh, vaping lung injury, I think it's much more, even though, you know, that the CDC uses EVALI, I, I think saying vaping lung injury cases or something like that is more, um, is, is, is stronger in terms of uh, tying vaping into the, the negative outcome that you're hoping to avoid by not using, right? Um, and in, in addition, I think that, uh, and I think this kind of plays into one of the subsequent questions that, that you all had, had listed, uh, using for, for effective uh, counter marketing, usually it's you're trying to make it as hard hitting, especially for tobacco, as hard hitting and uh, not just words, but also visual graphics imagery that evokes, you know, beyond just rational, you know, scientific logic, some visceral emotional response, right? Um, that oftentimes, some of the, the more effective tobacco counter marketing messages have relied on those. Great question. So we're still on terminology questions. Uh, considering that some of the nicotine is now created in a lab and not directly from the tobacco leaf and many nicotine products do not contain any trace of tobacco, should we be shifting our language, uh, especially in legal docs, policies, ordinances, et cetera, to nicotine instead of tobacco? That's a great question. I'm I'm not familiar with um, the the notion of the nicotine being um, artificially created in in a lab, and and so if if that is the case, then then probably. But I would recommend uh, getting uh, legal consultation um, from organizations like the uh, I think it's the Tobacco Legal Consortium or no uh, Public Health. Law Center now, I believe is the name of it. Um, yes, the Public Health Law Center uh, might be able to provide um, consultation on the, the for you on the best practices on um, what specific uh, language to be using for um, tobacco or, or nicotine products in your policy that you're you're trying to get implemented. So I would definitely recommend um, reaching out to someone for that uh, legal consultation. I wonder if, too, a lot of people don't wouldn't associate a tobacco policy with e-cigarettes at this point. Like I, I don't know anything about this, but I wonder if that's something that's this person is also thinking of. Especially yeah. since I think we've seen that there's research that youth sometimes don't realize that their jewel pods have nicotine in them. Yeah, and and so. The, the best practice that, that I heard from um, the tobacco law, or I'm sorry, the public health law center was to include the different language, smoke-free, tobacco-free, and e-cigarette or vape-free vape policy um, and use those, those three different terms throughout. Um, that was just uh, a few months ago. So I, I don't, maybe six months ago or, or probably less. So I don't know if their advice has changed based on any, any changes in um, uh, how nicotine is, is being derived. Um, however, it is also very important to, beyond the policy language itself, most people who hear about the policy aren't hearing about it by seeing the actual policy and reading through the policy verbatim. So in your communication campaign that goes along with it, making it explicitly clear what, what falls within the um, purview of the policy. And so to follow up on that, we have a question um, about smoking marijuana and CBD use. Um, by using the term tobacco free policy, does that leave marijuana and CBD use unaddressed in that policy? That's a great question. So from my understanding, that's why beyond tobacco free, they, they suggest using tobacco free, smoke free and vape free so that smoking and vaping would be inclusive of marijuana products. 
and then also explicitly including that in the policy that it includes marijuana products or marijuana products and it's getting more complex now right or THC or CBD um, derivatives or things like that right all right um in terms of your study, how did you define the difference between a smoke-free campus and a tobacco and e-cigarette free campus? Was there a difference or was the purpose to determine if students felt there was a difference? Great question. So we just said, we just asked whether or not they supported a smoke-free campus policy. And then in a, a subsequent question, whether they uh, supported a, an entirely tobacco-free campus policy that was inclusive of e-cigarettes. And so our, our findings uh, were, were very strong in that, that uh, everyone who supported a tobacco-free campus policy also supported for a smoke-free campus, also supported a smoke-free campus policy because smoking is inclusive of tobacco. So we, had, we statistically adjusted for that. So we were really looking at the individuals who, predicting individuals who were, um, in support of a tobacco-free campus policy, adjusting for their support of a smoke-free campus policy. Um, so I think that really strengthened our findings. Uh, so we have a couple questions about um, e-cigarette use and uh, COVID infection rates. Do you have any data about this? Uh, someone asked, can you speak further on the statement that e-cigarette users are five times more likely to become infected with COVID? I haven't heard that data, so. Yeah, so there were, there were two, two studies on this um, topic to date. The first one looked at, specifically among uh, young, young people, um, I believe young adults, um, but it might have also included youth, uh, which was just published this last year. They found that, um, young people who used e-cigarettes had five times the, the odds of testing positive for the coronavirus. And that youth who had, young people who had used both e-cigarettes and who had smoked um, recently had seven times the odds of testing positive for the coronavirus. Um, and there's, a, beyond, beyond this strong association, there's a number of um, theoretically, uh, strong theoretical reasons why this, why this would be observed, right? And so we know that smoking and e-cigarette use compromises lung functioning, um, which is an important risk factor for transmission of the, the coronavirus and worse outcomes. Um, we know that uh, the behavior itself uh, discourages wearing masks, results in repeated uh, hand-to-mouth um, touching behaviors, right, which also puts people at risk for the coronavirus. And we know that young people um, share uh, cigarettes and, and electronic cigarettes, and so that also increases risk of the coronavirus. Um, and so I think that in and of itself is a very, very strong finding with, with strong biological plausibility. There was also a more recent study that was, that was published just um, very recently. I, not exactly sure when, but within the last few months, that was an ecological study um, that uh, wasn't at the individual level, but showed similar findings between areas that had, um, I believe it was either weaker tobacco control policies and or higher smoking rates, and that that was significantly associated with uh, greater um, prevalence of uh, coronavirus cases. Um, so, so to my knowledge, those are the only two studies that have been published on it to date. Um, but I know that's a very, uh, and, and they also identified in that first study that, um, or I guess in a number of studies, they've identified that uh, people who, despite um, what people initially thought uh, that um, smoking could be a protective factor, uh, they're finding to the contrary that people who smoke are um, have, have far greater odds of having uh, disease progression from coronavirus and worse outcomes. They failed in those initial studies to account for the fact that um, in absence of the coronavirus, people who, uh, are, people who smoke 
are more likely to have coronavirus-like symptoms and are therefore more likely to get tested. So there's initial studies that showed that, that, that they concluded that, oh, smoking looks like it's a protective factor. They failed to account that smokers were more likely to um, get the coronavirus test in absence of having the disease because they had symptoms that were similar to the coronavirus just because they smoked. Does that make sense? All right, so I'm going to jump back to the third question from Kadka. Uh, what steps should students and faculty take if they want to start a tobacco free campus committee at their school? Which players or stakeholders should they include? Good question. So for us, um, it's been critical to have support from all relevant organizations across our campus, including human resources, facilities, housing, um, student life, student support and advocacy center, uh, student, student health services, student health advisory board, university life, communications, university communications, uh, student conduct, um, faculty senate, staff senate, student government, just to name a few. Um, sustainability, Office of Compliance. I mean, there's there's all sorts of stakeholders that this affects. And as you, it's kind of an iterative process. As you bring more people into your committee, you realize how much more, uh, more people are affected by this. Um, another big one that our university was concerned about initially was um, the Into Mason program, which is our, our international student population, how that would affect um, uh, our international students as well. So we have several representatives as well. Um, we also greatly benefited by being uh, connected with and supported by um, organizations in our community, including the County Health Department and the Community Services Board, by other institutions via the Northeast College Summit, and by national organizations, including CADCA, uh, Tobacco 21, and through the support of our American Cancer Society grant, and similarly support from their network uh, the American Non-Smokers Rights Foundation, the Public Health Law Center, and all of the, the previous um, uh, grant awardees or grantees who had received this uh, American Cancer Society grant who can share their um, expertise in going through this process. So <clears throat> my, my biggest advice, uh, my biggest initial advice would be to actually be to get connected and get mentorship from at least two different sources. So first would be someone who's gone through this process for a similar-ish issue at your university um, so that you can help get an understanding from them of how policy change happens specifically at your university. And second, getting mentorship from someone else who's successfully gone through this process and gotten a model tobacco free campus policy implemented at a peer institution, again, that's, that's relatively similar to yours, to get a feel for what worked for them and what lessons that, that they had to learn the hard way um, to help guide your efforts. All right, we have several questions about resources regarding uh, communications and terminology. So I'm gonna ask those now. Um, one is, is there a list of suggested terminology to use versus technology to avoid? And then uh, someone else is asking if you've developed a resource sheet or a cheat sheet that outlines effective versus ineffective language and terminology. That's a great idea. I, I haven't. Um, so this, this one study was just published within the, within the last year or so. And we have a sub subsequent study already in the works. Um, maybe after this, maybe after we, we publish um, some, or maybe after while we're publishing manuscripts from this subsequent study, after we've analyzed this data, uh, we might develop a a uh, um, brief guide on on maybe best practices on on wording. It's a great idea. So thank you. Uh, do you recommend campus policy enforcement in for these tobacco and smoke-free policies? 
So yes, um, and what this looks like is going to differ uh, based on the university. And so for, for our university, we already had mechanisms in place for that, that were different for students, faculty, other employees, visitors who violated any policies that we had. And so really for, for us, we just relied on those enforcement mechanisms that were already in place and the um, organizations or agencies on campus that dealt with those policy violations respectively. And so um, that's, I think that's an important part of the, the conversation to have for our committee. We had a, a whole separate subcommittee devoted to figuring out enforcement issues and we had stakeholders that were already responsible for enforcing other policy violations across campus who were involved in that conversation and made sure that, that the enforcement made sense. All right, we're gonna wrap up the question and answer with this final question from Katka. Where can interested coalition members go to find more information about your work? And are there any resources you recommend checking out for low funded organizations or departments who want to learn more about effective communication strategies they can implement in their campaigns? Great, so I think this is probably my most relevant published work on e-cigarettes to date. There are a few studies that I've published on e-cigarette explosion injuries, specifically that have estimated the number of e-cigarette explosion injuries in the US, as well as um, liquid nicotine ingestion uh, the emergency department visits associated with those. So those estimates have been helpful for some localities that um, successfully advocated for stronger local regulations on e-cigarettes. You can probably find those articles relatively easily just by Googling Rossheim e-cigarette explosion. Um, there are three, three studies that I've done um, with updated estimates. Uh, however, I have several uh, additional related e-cigarette counter-marketing studies in the works that are related to a grant that I received last summer. So I'm wondering if we might be able to coordinate sharing the press releases of highly relevant new published studies through some sort of listserv or something that, that you might have. Um, and so we might, might be able to coordinate that. And for the second part of the question, um, for general introductory information about tobacco counter marketing, I would definitely recommend starting with, there's a CDC guide that's called designing and implementing an effective tobacco counter-marketing campaign. And you can find that just by Googling that. You can find it online for free. So it's called, it's a CDC guide called designing and implementing an effective and an effective tobacco counter-marketing campaign. So I think that's a, a very good um, place for, for initial information and in, in guiding um, the design and implementation of a tobacco free or a tobacco counter-marketing campaign. All right, thank you. So um, I think we're going to wrap up now since we're just past 2 p.m. Uh, but be before we do wrap up, I have several announcements. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I will distribute the slides following this webinar to those who participated. And that email is also going to contain a short evaluation for this webinar. So please fill that out. We really value your feedback um, about these webinars. And if you'd like a letter of participation, you'll be able to see a link to view and download the letter of participation from the thank you page of the evaluation. So you must fill out the evaluation to get to the letter. And then you want to download the letter right after you fill out the evaluation, because you won't be able to get back to the thank you page to download it later. I'm also going to post uh, the recording of this webinar and the resources that were mentioned in the question and answer session on the CADCA website. So you'll be able to view them there. Thank you to Dr. Rossheim for the wonderful comprehensive presentation on your work and for your commitment to providing relevant and current material. And thank you to all the webinar participants for your comments, questions, and insights. There were so many, we couldn't get to all of them, but they were great questions.